Hello, welcome ladies and gentlemen to today's Humanities in Action uh, talk, Historical Injustice and Memory Today, Genocide, Colonialism, and the Contested Past. Uh, we are just so uh, excited to be able to be able to do this in the Flyleaf studio uh, we have, and it's a delight to be able to uh, be able to reach you virtually like this. I know, of course, we miss every one of you. We wish that we could be here live like we usually are in Flyleaf Books, and soon enough, let's hope it happens. But in the meantime, we're very, very thankful that we can uh, uh, reach you this way. I also want to thank a few of our sponsors. The Cotton Merker Group and Morgan Stanley have been uh, underwriting our programs for uh, several uh, years now. We're very grateful for their support, especially for our K-12 programs programming. Uh, we also want to thank Carolina Meadows, a retirement community in Chapel Hill, fantastic partners in promoting and publicizing our, our programs and also recently joined on to supporting our K-12 programs as well. Our great partner, the General Alumni Association. I know several of you are members. If you're not members, you should be, uh, who have uh, provided uh, wonderful support for publicity and cross-promotion, including several wonderful programs that we're doing together, like Lunch with Friends and Strangers, our biography series, which we just kicked off uh, last Friday. Uh, really wonderful partners and very happy. And finally, we need to thank uh, Flyleaf Books, all the wonderful people at Flyleaf Books who have uh, allowed us to use this space. Uh, I always say a true sign of civilization is a fully functioning independent bookstore and Chapel Hill is blessed to have Flyleaf Books and we are blessed to have them as our partner. Please go to flyleafbooks.com. You'll find a wonderful uh, uh, host of books. They have a very brisk business here even though the floor, sales floor is not open. So please order your books through Flyleaf Books. Come on by and pick them up and, uh, and check out their website for their own uh, initiatives, events, and sales and whatnot. So thank you to all of our sponsor sponsors. I also want to big, a big shout out to a person I see and you can't, and that is Paul Benici, who's about, I don't know, maybe 10 feet away from me. And uh, Paul has just been doing excellent work. Um, he's our producer for these events and all the technology, um, and has really just been doing fantastic work. So we're so thankful for all the effort that goes into putting this together. Thank you, Paul. And also thank you, Vicki Breeden, who's monitoring this uh, uh, remotely. And, uh, and if you have any questions for either Paul or Vicki about any of the technological things, if something's not coming through, please put it in the chat uh, box and we'll respond to it as quickly as we can. We also want to remind you folks that at the end of our talk, we'll have our question and answer session. And at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Please try to put your questions there so that they won't get lost in the chat. And we'll, uh, we'll forward them to our speaker. Um, before I go and, uh, and introduce our speaker, and uh, I do want to remind you folks that uh, Carolina Public Humanities has a host of programs available, including next week we'll be doing uh, another Adventures and Ideas. We used to call them weekend seminars, but in the virtual world, they go well beyond a weekend. We'll be spending next week looking at elections. Uh, we'll be looking at the election of 1800, the election of 1860, and the election of 1968, all three of which were very uh, con contentious uh, and uh, took place in very polarized times. So maybe you'll feel a little bit better about our own situation. I don't know, maybe you'll feel worse because the, the polarization has never really gone away. At any rate, it should be very illuminating with Lloyd Kramer, uh, Freddie Kiger, and Suzanne Globetti. This Thursday, though, uh, if you're interested, we do have a Humanities Salon conversation led by uh, Lloyd Kramer. We'll be talking about uh, Molly Worthen's uh, wonderful article on empathy. Um, we have a few seats left in that. A look at humanities.unc.edu, check out our great books reading groups, our language lunches, and of course these programs, uh, a whole host of programs coming up uh, in October, and we hope you can join us for them. So thank you for that. One other thing I want to remind you folks, I've sort of hinted at our K-12 programs and our community college outreach. We uh, encourage you to consider giving to Carolina Public Humanities in this very trying time. Uh, as you may know, we have a very reduced revenue stream, not being able to put on our, our programs. We're very thankful that you've decided to uh, invest in your learning uh, by joining us today. But we do encourage you to consider giving to Carolina Public Humanities to help us with our K-12 outreach programs and teachers, uh, our community college outreach programs, all of which have continued apace. Of course, we're doing them in this new format, uh, but we would uh, very much uh, like your continued support and would be honored if you would choose to do so. All donations are, of course, tax deductible and uh, gifts of any amount are, are very much appreciated. Well, thank you for that, uh, considering that, and thank you for allowing me to give you the preamble, but let's get right to it. As you know, Humanities in Action is a whole series designed around taking on contentious topics, taking on topics that sometimes might be controversial, but if we don't talk about them, we're not doing our civic duty as humanists uh, to engage with difficult topics and to, uh, and to uh, 
uh, allow you to uh, engage with the wonderful faculty and scholarship at UNC that can help us guide us through and understand some of the issues we're facing today. Uh, we are delighted to welcome uh, Dirk Moses uh, with us today. He's the Frank Porter Graham of Global Human Rights Studies. I hope I said that correct. He will correct me. Uh, and I want to say how an odd experience it is to meet a colleague from the History Department for the very first time today because uh, Professor Moses arrived here in the middle of a pandemic, um, which also is to say we're just so grateful uh, that um, he is following in the tradition of the professorship that he holds. Frank Porter Graham, of course, was uh, known for uh, his wonderful leadership at the university and for uh, the wonderful idea that the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, its borders are contigu uh, contiguous with those of the state. Uh, Carolina Public Humanities lives and breathes that. We want to reach every community we can, uh, and it's just a really fitting that the very first engagement we can bring in our colleague, Dirk Moses, whose uh, bio has been put in the chat so you can uh, read about his past. Um, coming over from Australia, here we are, the very first time, honored that that uh, within a month or so of being here is willing to reach our public audience. So we want to thank uh, Dirk for doing that. And without further ado, I want to invite Dirk Moses to give his wonderful talk, Historical Injustice and Memory Today, Genocide, Colonialism, and the Contested Past. Ladies and gentlemen, Dirk Moses. Thanks very much, Max, for the introduction and, of course, for the kind invitation to participate in the Carolina Humanities Program. I'm a big believer in public universities and public humanities, and so I regard it as core business for me, in addition to teaching and research in the usual way to participate in events like this and contribute in any way I can to sharing the kind of work we do inside the cloistered walls of the academy. Now, you've got my PowerPoint in front of you. There's gonna be quite a lot of it, so keep a close eye on the images because I'll be talking through them rather than giving you a turgid lecture. Just a brief uh, summary of who I am by looking at a couple of uh, titles of books that I have published over the years. So there's the uh, first one I did in 2004, the red one, Genocide and Settler Society, Frontier Violence and Stolen Indigenous Children in Australian History, was the first book. This is an anthology, mind you. I didn't I didn't write the whole thing. I, it, it's a compilation of essays by uh, various colleagues that I project manage. It's the first book on the subject in Australia. Then a few years later, I did one where I went global, so to speak, Empire, Colony, Genocide, Conquest, Occupation, and Support and Resistance in World History. Now, if you go to the next slide. See, see if it works there. Now it works. And there's a back button. Yeah. I moved more recently to looking into the 20th century. So the, the turquoise book, uh, colonial counterinsurgency and mass violence is about the end of the Dutch Empire in the East Indies, Indonesia in the late 40s, in which Frank Gordon Graham was actually involved as a UN diplomat. And uh, he's very, he played an important role in brokering the, uh, the agreement between the Indonesian, Indonesian nationalist forces and the Dutch government in granting independence to the Indonesians. That picture there depicts it, Dutch uh, colonial forces uh, storming a beach and trying to seize control of territory from Indonesian nationalist forces. There were two police actions in the late 40s which killed quite a lot of people. Um, this was classic counterinsurgency. And then uh, the book next to it is about violence that takes place, often genocidal violence that takes place inside post-colonial states, so after decolonization. And this is about the civil war in Nigeria in the late 60s, during which genocide was alleged. So we're all aware how the past, the colonial past, is impinging upon the present, as it has been for some time. Here are some examples. Here is the University of Glasgow uh, revealing to the world that it's uh, aware that one of its founders was engaged in the slave trade, one of its early rectors, and that one of its very early donations, the seed money of the university, uh, at least in its uh, growing phase, because I think it's a 17th century university, uh, what made his money in the slave trade uh, and has decided to uh, run a, uh, an investigative commission and then uh, pay reparations in the following way. It set up a university links and funded, funded them with the university in the West Indies. Of course, this is where the sugar trade, the sugar plantations were in which the donor, 
uh, was investing. Then on the right, we have a, a Portuguese example. Uh, during a recent election, a Portuguese politician said, let's open a museum of discovery about how uh, the early Portuguese explorers you know, opened up the quote-unquote new world. And then there was a, uh, a fractious public debate about to the extent to which the dark side of the Spanish exploration or the Port sorry, Portuguese exploration would be highlighted in the museum. The fact, for example, that Portuguese galleons took about half the slaves uh, across the Atlantic, South Atlantic, to uh, South America and Central America in the 17th and 18th centuries. So these things don't go away. Now, the, the case is also in Australia, which didn't have formal sla chattel slavery we li like we had in the US and in the Americas. Here, we had what was, we think of as the functional equivalent, blackbirding. In the late 19th century, uh, some 60,000 uh, Melanesians, South, South Sea Islanders from what is now Vanuatu, New Caledonia, and the Solomon Islands, were brought to Australia, mostly to work on sugar plantations, as you can see in that image. Uh, they received extremely low wages and had terrible conditions. 15,000 of them died in situ, were basically buried in the fields. And one of the main towns in the area, Townsville, is named after one of the entrepreneurs who financed all this. Towns was his name. And you can see the newspaper clipping on the right uh, is, uh, highlights a controversy about a statue to towns. And we'll talk more about that mm -hmm. later in the talk. Uh, another case which has come up more recently is about domestic uh, service, uh, which continued on to the 1960s. So here we have a tweet from a young woman who's talking about this photograph. She says, my grandmother was a house servant slash slave to this white woman in the picture. My grandmother raised that woman's children when her babies had to stay somewhere else. The youngest child in the picture is my mother. Don't tell me there wasn't slavery in Australia. Uh, the, fa the fact that there's a debate about slavery in Australia is something that we'll come back to as well later in the presentation. Now, these things are hot topics in Australia as they are here. Here are some photographs, some of which I took myself, about which depict indigenous activism by Aboriginal Australians. And you'll see a couple of slogans there which recur. One is no pride in genocide and turn Australia Day into Invasion Day. Australia Day is the 26th of January. It's when the first fleet landed in near Sydney in 1788 on the 26th of January. So uh, rather than celebrate that as Australia Day, let's call it an Invasion Day, they say. Or at least let's, let's think about that. Now, here's the table of contents, the structure of my presentation today. I'm going to proceed uh, in six steps, and we're going to start where the yellow is. So we're going to talk a bit about pulling down uh, graffiti and graffitiing monuments to colonial heroes and changing place names. Some of this may be familiar. I'm not going to really focus much on the American cases because I think you're well familiar with those. Uh, we can look mainly in Australia and some other cases. Then we're going to say, well, why? what does all this mean? Then we're going to ask, is this really new, that there's criticism of imperialism and its legacies? Then we proceed further. Why is this spike of criticism happening now? Or as you Americans like to say, uptick. The rest of the world we say spike. And then we're going to sort of consider how are people trying to handle these fractious issues now in different ways. And of course, that's highly political. So let's run through these images. Now, the, the most recent episode of Iconoclasm starts in South Africa, actually, in 2016 and 17. The Roads Must Fall campaign began on the campus of Cape Town University, where a statue to Sir Cecil Rhodes uh, uh, stood actually just above the campus. I remember visiting it just before it was taken down uh, when I was there for a conference. Uh, here we have a, a theatrical uh, po uh, performance on the plinth where it was. You can see the crane pulling it up, you know, hanging in the, the statue in the background there. Then it travels to Oxford, where of course the Rhodes Scholarship is hosted. And in front of Oriel, I think it's, is it Magdalen or Oriel? I think it's Oriel College. You'll see uh, the Rhodes Must Fall demonstrations, and at the very top there, there's a statue of Rhodes just above the word must. Okay. 
Now, just this year, you'll recall the scenes of the former uh, slave trader and then philanthropist, Edward Colston, uh, being, his statue being pulled down and then uh, thrown in the drink there uh, just a few months ago. And then uh, just last week in Colombia, uh, indigenous people pulled down the statue of a conquistador in, uh, uh, in, a, in a provincial town. Now, uh, this, this is supposed to be a video, uh, but it's not working at the moment. But the link will be put in the chat, I'm told, so you can watch it. It's just a YouTube clip. Uh, it didn't work for technical reasons, but uh, there's a bit of text there which I find is very instructive. And all these instances show that this is a global moment. It's not just happening in the US and the UK. Whoops. Back to Australia. Uh, graffitiing of monuments has been going on for a couple of years as well. This is also from 2017. Once again, those two slogans change the date of Australia Day to Invasion Day and uh, no pride in genocide. Uh, now, this, that, those ones were in Sydney. This is now in Perth in Western Australia. Uh, this is to James Sterling. This is his statue, which has been very creatively graffitied with the Aboriginal flag. Okay, so they've put the Aboriginal flag symbol over the plaque and over the book he's holding. Uh, and he's got red hands because he's got blood in his hands. Because when he was the governor, he was previously a naval officer and then a governor for a while, he was, uh, he led a punitive um, expedition against uh, Aboriginal people in the Pinjara in 1834, which killed lots of uh, warriors and also women and children. And they don't think he should be honoured in this way. Now, one reaction of Bors has been to wrap up the slides, like uh, the statues. In this case, you have the Prime Minister of Australia in, in, a, in a regional town being wrapped up like this, a bit like Christo, the, uh, the famous, the famous uh, artist. And the one on the right is uh, Winston Churchill in Great Britain, um, so and that's in central London. And we'll come back to that case later as well. Uh, not only have statues been graffitied or torn down, buildings and place names are being renamed. So just recently, I think a week or two ago, the University of Edinburgh, so in Scotland again, David Hume Tower was renamed uh, because of the racist views that he's been um, identified as holding. Now we're going to return to the ethics of this and the practicalities of this later in the talk as well. I mean given the ghastly ugly building I'm sure actually he wouldn't be so upset. Um, one that you may not have heard about uh, is a very interesting one is the controversy in London in the UK a couple of weeks ago about whether the words of rule Britannia, it's a term or a, a ditty that I don't think many Americans would enjoy singing, given the political history of this country, uh, which, are, which are sung at the proms, which you can see is a highly jingoistic uh, concert that's held um, each year, all, the, all that British flag waving. Uh, and the, usually it's sung, and the, the, the idea with this year was because of its imperialistic uh, tone, we should just play the tune, but not the words. And this is part of the current mood this summer. Back in Berlin, over the, over the, uh, the channel, there's now a concerted campaign to change the names of street signs, which are named after colonial heroes and battle victories. Luderitz Straße was named after the founder of German Southwest Africa, uh, whereas the Maji Maji Alley, so Maji Maji Alley, uh, was named after the uprising in Tanganyika, which was another German colony, between 1905 and 1907, which was brutally crushed by German imperial troops, including through famine and so forth, which killed tens of thousands of uh, the locals. Uh, and these are, are being gradually renamed because of local activism and a change in public mood. Okay, what does this all mean? What does this all mean? Well, I think there are two elements. In the, in the metropole, in places like the United Kingdom and in Germany, which were the, the seat of empires, but this could also uh, be the case for Lisbon, as we saw in the uh, Portuguese uh, clip earlier, but also in, uh, in Brussels for the Belgian Empire. We're dealing with the decolonization of memory, uh, changing uh, 
place names uh, which honor colonial heroes and monuments and so forth. Okay. In settler colonies like the United Kingdom, sorry, like the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth, uh, it's a bit more radical in implication. It's about the symbolic refounding of those settler polities to make good the injustices that were committed in their foundation, above all to indigenous people. In the, in the United States, you had this added complication of slavery then coming as a, as a second historical injustice, and one that actually, in terms of public attention, takes up m much more oxygen than the Native American one. And we'll return to this theme throughout the, uh, throughout the talk. Now, it's important to remember that the toppling of monuments is elemental in founding moments. So here we have a, a, a screenshot of a tweet that I, that I took as I was peering into people's conversations among historians, where uh, someone points out, well, you know, we don't have statues to the Tories or General Cornwalls in the US today because they're all torn down after the American Revolution. Um, and that this, this so-called vandalism and destruction of symbolism is, a is elemental to a founding moment, especially of a republic. And uh, the, the same goes for the tearing down of Saddam Hussein's statue in Iraq. And in, this, in the bottom right-hand corner, the uh, covering up of the Nazi swastika with the American flag uh, before it was torn down. So when you have founding moments, new regimes, regime change, then you get a change, of course, of the ruling symbols. Now, what I mean by symbolic foundation is the following. Uh, anyone who studies the French Revolution will know that a violent refounding of a state is when you actually lop off the head of a monarch. Uh, in this case, it's symbolic because what they've done in this case, this is here in Raleigh, down the road, is that a Confederate statue has been, symbol has been hung. And that, so it's not a human being, it's a statue. So it's, a, it's symbolic. There's no, uh, there's no violence against human beings. Now, my own view is a, uh, with my own sort of semi-pacifistic ethics is this is far more preferable than to, to um, violence. So symbolic refounding of a state uh, is better than a, a violent refounding of one, at least for the innocent victims. Okay, now, is any of this really that new? It's been uh, certainly uh, noticeable that the intensity of this summer's uh, debates and uh, activism on the streets about uh, racial justice and, the, the, frankly, the assault on many of these symbols uh, is something new. Uh, but we know the debate about Confederate statues has been going on for a long time. What I want to show in the next couple of slides is that the critique of empire has actually been going on for hundreds of years, and it's a very European tradition. And it goes back to the founding moments of the uh, Iberian conquest of the Americas, to Las Casas' short account of the destruction of the Indies. Uh, so uh, in that book and, and others, he criticized the excesses of the Spanish conquest, the enslavement of the local population and many massacres and atrocities. Uh, he himself was not attacking the idea of Spanish empire should hold. I mean, he was a priest. Uh, he thought a, a sort of a more gentle and humane empire would be more conducive to uh, conversion and turning, turning the heathens into Christians. Uh, so he's not anti-imperial. There, there is a more radical version of the critique of empire, which will come mainly from the colonized themselves. But it's important to note that a very decided, emphatic, and passionate critique of European excesses in the colonies is, has been part of, the, of European political culture for 500 years. And uh, it naturally... Uh, intensified at the period, uh, the high noon of European imperialism before the First World War. So we, here we have a French image uh, which inverts the uh, hierarchical status between barbarism and civilization. So on the left we have, uh, this is from the Boxer Rebellion of course, uh, we have uh, a boxer there um, murdering uh, a European and that's barbarism. But then the, the 
the uh, cartoonist ironically flips it around and shows the basically the same picture but just with uh, different role play and they call that civilization so it's a bitter critique of the hypocrisy of civilization and its uh, reversion or to violence when it feels its interests are at stake uh, just a few years later uh, the um, crimes in the Congo by Leopold II in Belgian Congo uh, sparked an international outcry, an international humanitarian campaign against the abuses. And here's a, uh, one of the famous pamphlets that was produced by E.D. Morrill. He called it a crime so awful, a scandal of such magnitude, tragedy so immeasurable, the world has surely never seen this like in combination. And this, this kind of rhetoric would recur in every major colonial scandal uh, over the decades. Now, of course, uh, as I hinted before, the colonized protest as well. In the very same year, uh, or a year later, actually, 1906 and 1907, um, you see here in a uh, cartoon produced by an Arabic uh, cartoonist, a critique of uh, the French uh, in Morocco and the British in Egypt uh, for various excesses. The French bombardment of Casablanca in the year before the Denshawi incident in uh, Egypt where a misunderstanding between British officers and villagers led to, the, to, to a local riot and then ultimately executions of locals, which inflamed public opinion in Egypt and uh, was an important part of the nationalist mobilization for independence. But you can see there, this is a pretty intense depiction of uh, European soldiers standing on the the skeletons uh, of the murdered uh, Arabs. Um, so you can see this as a decided critique of empire by the locals. Indigenous activism took various forms. Here, back to Australia, we have uh, a conference of uh, Aboriginal Australians in the 1930s who are pleading for equal rights. Okay. Uh, when, when thinking about options of decolonization, you actually have to obviously look at population ratios. And by the 1930s, uh, indigenous people were a tiny minority. So decolonization can't mean national liberation as it could in Algeria, where the locals always outnumbered the settlers. Here the settlers are in charge. So seeking equal rights with the settlers is the, uh, the aim of the activism. Now, it's interesting how the word genocide accompanies this activism once the word is invented in the 1940s. If you look at the right-hand column there, this is from a Canadian newspaper, you'll see that uh, in this Indian newspaper that the word genocide is used as a fear that uh, uh, First Nations Canadians will experience, um, and of course that, and which they have experienced in the past. And this will come up again and again in the imagery that we see. Uh, now, the current debates about Columbus are not new either. Here's a, a headline from the LA Times from 1990. Uh, 1492 brought genocide. Why celebrate? Columbus. Discovery launched a terrible chapter in human history and millions still suffer the effects, wrote Roberto Rodriguez. And then a year later, a UPI report, uh, also in Los Angeles, uh, re depicts the following. Representatives of the American Indian tribes from Mexico, the US and Canada gathered in LA to launch a campaign to protest the celebration of the 500th anniversary of Columbus's discovery of America, etc, etc. So this is already 30 years ago and it continues. We were here centuries before he got to this place. We had homes, communities and government. He brought us nothing but death and the disease. This is a rejection of the civilizing mission. And then the accusation of genocide. It's what happened after Christopher Columbus came that we are protesting. The total genocide of Indian culture, etc. Okay. Now, what's a civilizing mission? Well, this is an imagery of it here from a French, uh, from a French cartoon or magazine from, I think, 1879. The, um, the angel of progress is uh, depicted there of a darkest Africa, which will explore and civilize. That image of the angel will come up uh, shortly in other, in other images. So it's not surprising that you'll see uh, 
memes like this on social media of indigenous defiance and sarcasm. So here we have uh, a Native American giving the finger to uh, uh, the American founding heroes. And then a declaration by others. We lived in this country before it was discovered. We don't want to, we don't want to hear that it was undiscovered. There was already human civilization here. But despite some breakthroughs recently, my sense is that uh, it's pretty ignored for, by and large, and settler colonial memory continues to this day. Uh, let's look at Australia again. Uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, street signs like this, Murdering Creek. Now have a guess why they're called Murdering Creek. These, the, or, or Murdering um, Road and so forth. These, uh, I mean, they don't commemorate, but they mark the place where there were massacres. And in that sense, it's no, uh, it's no secret how the country uh, was conquered and entered from the hands of indigenous people uh, and to those of settlers, moved from those of indigenous people to those of settlers. Uh, but the blindnesses are, are more striking than, than the insight. So here's, for example, a, uh, an august colonial residence, which has become an agricultural college. If you look at the website of the college and also the National Trust website, which gives you quite a detailed history of it when it was built in 1940, sorry, 1840, it doesn't tell you that it was actually constructed on a massacre site, uh, which occurred in uh, 1839, uh, adjacent to Murdering Gully. And we only know this because an historian wrote an article about it uh, a few years ago in The Guardian, based on his own research in Victoria. And this is just a clip, uh, a screenshot of the image from that newspaper article. Now let's look uh, at uh, more settler colonial aesthetics in my own hometown of Brisbane. Unfortunately, these images have been shrunk in the conversion to, um, to this PowerPoint version. But what you can see there is the Brisbane City Hall, and, uh, which is a neoclassical structure from, built between 1917 and 1928. And then the, its architect, uh, or the designer of the, uh, that, that flat triangle over the entrance, uh, which is called a, uh, I'm trying to get the technical term for it, it'll come to me, it's called a, a tympanum. It was designed by uh, Daphne Mayo, who's a fascinating woman. She, I mean, she was uh, a female uh, sculptor and was res responsible for uh, many of the important public um, monuments in, in, the, um, in the state of Queensland, which is, of course, in the north right-hand corner of, the, of Australia. So she herself is a very interesting person. And there, there she is chipping away at what? It's that angel of progress again. Here's, an, uh, here's a frontal uh, take on it. So that's, the, that's above the portal of the building. And what you see there, of course, is the explorers on the right, and uh, the settlers on the left going out with their cattle and sheep and so forth and making the, uh, the wild country uh, prosperous and bountiful. And the, I'm sure you'll see versions of this in many states in this country. This is classic settler colonial imagery. Now, what's for us really interesting is the following. If you look more closely here, there she is on the right-hand corner, is that image in the middle of a, of, a sleepingly, of a seeming sleeping indigenous person underneath a shield and then a kangaroo to the left. Uh, well, the program uh, from 1930, when, when it was officially opened, said, on the left-hand side of the timberland, the native life is represented dying out before the approach of white men. I mean, I mean this, is, this is the year my father was born in 1930 in the state of Queensland. It's not that long ago. And the, the language of dying races was still uh, quite prevalent in the mainstream of uh, white society in Australia. Now, just to give you a sense of what settler colonialism means for the local, not just for the indigenous people, but for the, but for the, for the flora and fauna, consider this. At the very same time that Daphne Mayo is making those uh, sculptures in the late 20s, the Queensland government had uh, re-permitted the killing of koalas. Uh, so there was open season on koalas, which were hunted basically to the edge of, distinction, of extinction. And according to this slide, the pelts were then exported to this country. I don't know who still has a koala pelt uh, lying around, but um, maybe your grandmother has one. Now, 
Needless to say, indigenous elders have complained about this tympanum. So here's an article from 2004. City Hall sculpture offends indigenous Australians. Brisbane Council of Elders Herb Bly says it's time his organisation confronted City Hall about the sculpture. It brings back that memory of the old days when the white people could do what they like with you. I don't think it should be there, etc. Right? But it's, nothing has happened. So that's my point, is that there can be complaints. In fact, there have been for decades, but nothing really happens. It's quite rare. And just as a, uh, a uh, to, to circle back to the to koalas, to give you a sense of uh, settler colonial imperatives and the way it affects the environment, uh, here's a, an article that's just from now. Uh, it's about the Queensland government's expert koala panel found that this population decline signs shows no signs of stopping. The decline is related to the ongoing habitat loss in southeast Queensland result, which is what the population mainly is, resulting from increasing urbanisation, other threats such as dog, dog attacks are the worst actually, as well as uh, being hit by cars associated with development and so forth. Uh, and in but Eastern Australia, basically the, the uh, conservationists are saying koalas will be extinct in the next couple of decades if this continues. And it will continue because uh, in expansion and urbanisation is the DNA of these societies. Uh, another example of the, you know, the, the juggernaut of settler colonial development is, uh, occurred just a few months ago when Rio Tinto, so a very large mining company, blew up sacred caves, uh, they're at the bottom right there, in the Pinjara, which where that massacre was I mentioned from 1834, uh, which were 46,000 years old and had paintings and, and drawings in there, as you can see on the top left. They, um, they said it was an accident, but in fact it was... Uh, uh, um, approved by the minister. Uh, I can't get into detail, we don't have time, but the basic point is that indigenous people don't have a veto right about protecting sacred sites and heritage uh, when a mining company makes an application to the minister of resources. The minister can always override the indigenous objection. Uh, and this gives you a, a sense of, once again, the DNA of settler colonial societies. When indigenous, peop indigenous people are tolerated when they're out of the way, and when they're not sitting on uh, important resources. If they are, then they're moved. If they resist, they're crushed. Uh, one way or the other, in this case, they're legally crushed. Now, there'll be, there were obviously protests about this, and in fact, it became a, a major scandal, and the, one, of the, one of the major executives had to resign. But uh, th this is really just uh, window dressing. Uh, indigenous people are, are, are making representations on all fronts. So in the top left-hand corner there, we have uh, the War Memorial in uh, Brisbane. I think that's the one in Brisbane, uh, which commemorates fallen Australian soldiers in, in many wars. Uh, and this Indigenous activist is saying, hang on, the first war happened here in Australia against us. Uh, where is the memorialization to that? Um, so uh, it, this results in memes with, which look like this, very similar to Native American ones. White Australia likes to talk about Aboriginal boomerangs, the outback, and even the dreaming, so all the folkloric stuff, which is not very political. But when words like invasion and genocide are mentioned, there's a great silence. Okay, now why is all this happening now? Uh, so some text, so I'm just going to share with you. I think there are a number of reasons why there's a spike or an uptick right now. One is that colonised and minority communities are taken a little more seriously. Um, the second is that historians are now working on reconstructing their experiences, uh, which was not the case uh, a generation or two ago. Thirdly, historians that now come from those communities, and to that extent the university has changed dramatically from a generation or two ago as well. Now, in in engaging in this research, historians are not polemicizing. They're just reconstructing the experiences of all these different perspectives rather than giving sort of one uplifting or inspirational one. That was usually the case in liberal conservative settler narratives, frankly, until recently. Um, another reason, it, it has nothing to do with the historical profession per se, but uh, the global interaction <clears throat> on social media where things can go viral. And I'll show some images about this shortly. I don't think anything, any of this has to do with what um, people are calling uh, critical race theory in somewhat hysterical terms. Uh, 
um, and we'll get back to that as well. And lastly, I think generational change is important as well. Uh, younger Americans, younger Australians uh, feel very strongly about these issues of justice. I don't think that's got anything to do with critical race theory because uh, I'd say a lot of them haven't studied um, that kind of thing in the College of Arts and Sciences, but you know, they might be engineering students or something. So uh, it's got to do with a generational sensibility uh, which is global. Now to give you a sense of the kind of work historians are doing in my department, here's a brand new book by my colleague uh, Kathleen Duval, which is being launched actually tonight. Uh, let's look at the second paragraph there. Over the last decade, award-winning historian Kathleen Duval has revitalized the study of the early American marginalized voices. Now, in her book, Independence Lost, she recounts an untold story as rich and significant as that of the Founding Fathers. The history of the revolutionary era as experienced by slaves, American, Indian women, American Indians, women, and British loyalists living on Florida's Gulf Coast. So that's what I mean by multi-perspectival. But to give you a sense of how story, historians can act in public, the Prime Minister of Australia said, uh, there's no slavery in Australia, as the, the, um, the George Floyd Black Lives Matter issue washed up on our shores in the summer. He said, well, you know, we don't have anything to be ashamed about. We never had slavery. It's true we never had chattel slavery, but we had blackbirding and so forth, as I mentioned earlier. And historians rushed into print in the press, and journalists relying on historical research did so. Here's an article from the New York Times, even, on the, on the top left. And he was forced to apologize. Uh, which I thought was a, um, you know, a terrific example of the way historians can, can correct the record and uh, put politicians on the spot when they play fast and loose with the historical evidence. Now, this is an example of things going viral, as I said. Mimicry and inspiration. So uh, the, Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter moment has gone uh, global. And uh, it's, as we know, based on the shocking imagery of what happened to George Floyd. So here... A, uh, uh, an activist group dedicated to renaming streets, as we pointed out before in Berlin, uh, put the, uh, in the name of George Floyd over Morgenstrasse, which means Moor Street, as in the Moors, you know, who were, uh, uh, which was you know, a racialized term meaning Africans or slave traders, African slave traders, or even Ottomans. Um, it's a long European history, and it was changed um, just quite recently. Um, as you can see in that text, um, the, uh, the, the Berlin Transport Company announced on the 3rd of July that its underground station would be renamed Glinkerstraßen after a, uh, a Russian composer. Now, to give you another example of uh, going global, this is from 2017. And you'll see the very small text at the bottom. It says you know, we, we're, that the debate about Townsville, that uh, black birder, uh, after whom ta um, called Town, Sir Robert Towns, after whom Townsville is named, has become uh, has been put on the agenda because of the debate about Confederate statues in America. So this is before Black Lives Matter in its current moment, but about the uh, debate about um, uh, Confederate statues in America coming to Australia and then interacting with local memory activi activism and cultures. So this is something that uh, the velocity and speed of social media and imagery allows. Uh, and that wasn't the case 20, 30 years ago. Um, now, the generational change, I think, is just apparent by looking at the faces of the people in, in these demonstrations in Australia. These are demonstrations against Rio Tinto for exploding, uh, dynamiting those uh, rock caves. R Rio TNT, -toe, as you can see there. But you have here uh, very young people who are in coalition with indigenous people. So that's what I mean by renewed coalitions, multiracial coalitions, which uh, are quite significant and are affecting public opinion. And this is another reason why this is happening now. Okay, uh, where is all this going to go in the future? Well, let's look at a few episodes or a few modalities of dealing with this contentious memory. How to handle monuments, for example. One way is to put temporary plaques on them. As you can see here, here's a, a monument to uh, you know, heroic uh, explorer, another Scot uh, in Gippsland in uh, 1840, I think that one says. And someone's plastered over there. Well, in 1843, Angus Macmillan led a, uh, the Highland Brigade in a massacre of dozens of uh, indigenous people, you know, Black Lives Matter. Okay. And um, back to Edward Colston in Bristol, you know, whose statue was thrown into the, 
into the water. You know, this plaque is dedicated to the slave of that, to the slaves that were taken uh, from their homes. But of course, these are just temporary. They're bits of cardboard and they're not permanent solutions. Uh, but nor is encasing uh, Churchill in this way either because it can be subverted by graffiti. Don't open racist inside. So this isn't, this isn't uh, 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 a permanent solution either because it will be subverted. It's certainly not satisfactory for the people who encased Churchill like this. I'm not getting into the merits of whether Churchill was a racist or not or deserves to be graffitied. It's, it's about the modalities of memory. Now, look, if we look at the American debate, we can see some very interesting discussions taking place, say, on Twitter among historians. So this is about whether adding a plaque, an explanatory plaque or statement next to, a, say, a Confederate statue is enough. So uh, here's a debate where someone says, well, placing additional markers in the same place doesn't fully mitigate the effect. This plaque remembering John Henry James lynching is overshadowed by a Confederate monument put there by the prosecutor who let the mob off, the mob get off without charges. Um, so uh, they're saying that it's not enough. Uh, likewise here, um, it's, it's morally timid, uh, these contextualizing plaque as if some kind of compromise position about uh, Confederate statues can be reached. If your plaque requires a small font and a lot of excuses, it doesn't visually disrupt the effects of the monument. So once again, it seems to be inadequate for a lot of people. I mean, you do need a magnifying glass to read that. While, meanwhile, you've got this towering monument which dominates uh, space. A uh, sarcastic view from one, uh, from one uh, cartoonist about this idea of contextualization is through putting you know, a much larger image of a slave underneath a Confederate monument in order to disrupt it. Now, back to Townsville. Uh, you know, what do the descendants of the blackbirders the, the, from the South Sea Islands say? Well, here's uh, Ms. Davies. She says the monuments in Townsville and Mackay that commemorate Robert Towns and John Mackay ignore the role they played in this history. She says, we came out of slavery. Today we stand here supposedly in a democratic society, but it's not too democratic when there's silence on the truth of the nation and how it was established. She actually doesn't want to tear down the monuments. She just wants to put explanatory stuff out there. So it's quite a moderate a moderate demand on her part. It's a terrific photo there. She's holding photos of her grandparents. This is much more current. This is now just from the last few months. So what did they do in Townsville? So the, the local government, which is quite conservative, understood that there's a problem. So they set up what's called a pioneer's walk. And this is now a statement from the, the local uh, councillors. Um, and the, the pioneers walk, so it's part of a park and there are four different statues. Uh, one of them it remains towns because they didn't want to take it down. And the, now there's John uh, Milton Black, who was a, a, an early mayor and a local colonial identity. Then, of course, they get a white woman in there uh, who was quite progressive. And then Eddie Marbo, who was an important Torres Strait Islander activist who was instrumental in uh, getting land rights recognized in the 1980s. So they say they are all significant parts of <coughs> Townsville history good or bad, and they've been involved in the creation of this community. Now, how did local South Sea Islander activists react? Well, they painted Robert Townsend's hands blood, because he's got blood on his hands. So they, they don't regard this as particularly uh, uh, a good solution. The question is, do new monuments add balance if the old monument stays? Uh, well, it's not meeting a positive reception at least for the, for the group that is supposed to be mollified by this more balanced perspective. But do note that Eddie Mabo is from the Torres Strait Island, is not a descendant of the, uh, the black-birded uh, South Sea Islanders. So they remain left out of this memory park. Uh, so this isn't really a solution either. Now what's going on in Germany outside Berlin may offer a solution. Here we have this museum uh, in the top left-hand corner, which was a uh, former depository. Uh, it's called the Citadel. And it's where they now, and it was empty, and now they put these disused monuments in there. And, the, and it's become a public museum. It says a museum where racist and oppressive statues go to die, but they actually don't go to die. As this text explains, they uh, become part of an active, uh, an active exhibition where, as it says, inside the museum, Visitors confront at eye level statues and monuments that used to represent power. 
You can touch everything. Nothing is put on a pedestal. You can talk about what makes you mad. And, and uh, recently they put a Nazi church bell in there. It's a big swastika on there. And uh, so it becomes an educational excursion opportunity. Uh, so memory isn't being erased. This is being displaced and put somewhere in a new context. I think that's a really, really interesting way of dealing with monuments. What about renaming? Well, it's come up in Australia as well. Here's a recent article. It's from August by a columnist in the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, it's about uh, an early uh, scientist, Banks, uh, after whom Bankstown is no named, which is a suburb in, uh, in Sydney. Uh, and he says, I think it's interesting. Uh, should we then expunge banks from everything? On the one hand, it would be wonderful to return to indigenous. No, notice how he capitalizes indigenous. That's very Australian and New, Ze and New Zealand and, um, and in Canadian norms. Uh, to return to indigenous names to counter the absurdity of locations that had names for thousands of years, suddenly renamed because of a white man's eyes were cast on them for the first time. On the other hand, where does it stop? Banks was a truly brilliant man, broadly decent. His attitudes to slavery were completely wrong-headed, but his actions and views were firmly on the side of legality at the time that he held them. So do we wipe out his name from everything because of that alone? Well, it's an interesting question. I don't have uh, a ready answer for that, but it's something that should be discussed, and that, it, that itself is part of refounding a polity. And as I said before, Glasgow University, to circle back to where we started, uh, has going now paying $20 million of Slade reparations by setting up a restorative justice scheme, uh, mainly through links with the University of the West Indies. Another is uh, returning human remains. Let's watch this video. These skulls are a grim reminder of what is now considered the first genocide of the 20th century. In what was then called German Southwest Africa, Tens of thousands of members of the Nama and Herero peoples were slaughtered by German colonizers after an attempted uprising in 1904. Their remains brought to Germany for now discredited scientific research on European racial superiority. Our ancestors who are here in front of us today have been here for too long and for no good reason at all. And as such, it is only proper that at last, after 114 years, we are here to take them back home. This is the third time Germany has returned human remains to Namibia. Namibia currently receives the most German aid per capita in Africa. One thing that hasn't happened during this visit is an official apology from the German government for the genocide in what is now Namibia. Many of the descendants of the victims say they are concerned about the progress on that and other issues. Some of those descendants held a separate vigil outside of the official ceremony. They have also filed an unusual lawsuit against Germany in a U.S. court seeking reparations under international law, driven largely by a lack of faith that the Namibian government is acting in their interests. We want the German government to apologize to admit the crime they committed, to show some remorse, and right the wrongs. You know, we were displaced, we lost the land, we lost our culture. Still, both governments insist that an apology and further action is coming. The horrific actions taken at that time under the German name would be considered genocide today, even if that was only later underscored by legal standards. That's why we're talking with our partners in Namibia about how to deal with this. For many of those involved in this process, that next step is long overdue. Ira Spitzer, CGTN, Berlin. Let's look at this one just for a few minutes. This is from 2009 in London. The remains were brought to a central London park after being handed over to the elders, but it's a miracle they made it to this smoking ceremony. The bones were found by workers clearing out a house in Cheshire. They were put up for auction, and during the bidding, a call from the Australian High Commission stopped any sale, as it was suspected they were Aboriginal remains. But the reason for smoking, the area used to smoke up all negative energy. Two Naranjiri elders from South Australia are in Britain to repatriate the remains from three museums 
and the auction house. They'll be sent to the National Museum of Australia, where it's hoped biometric analysis and archive detective work can identify which community they came from. Spiritually and uh, mentally and physically, it, it means a lot to my people to, to have the remains back home to have them so that we can, we can put them to rest. Major Sumner says around 600 Aboriginal remains are still kept in European institutions. He says all were stolen. But while a few years ago there was enormous resistance to handing remains back, attitudes have changed. It's a process of negotiation between equals of the, what matters as opposed to the kind of you know, violent sort of dismissal of any uh, you know, indigenous sensibilities, which is what happened in the past. While that process of negotiation has been a success here, there are still challenges. The elders will meet with the British Council later today to try and argue for the return of a skull that was turned into a water vessel. Philip Williams, ABC News, London. So you can see this means an awful lot. This means an awful lot to these people. Uh, and until remains, human remains, but also artifacts that were taken are returned, uh, there's a, a, an important unfinished element of decolonization. Now, let's move to re how this is resisted. Well, let's, this is the, the police outside uh, Ormond College at Oxford guarding the statue of Rhodes at the top in the middle there. Here um, is... Uh, local American patriots, I think from an Italian community, are guarding uh, a statue of Columbus just this summer. And uh, the same in Sydney, Australia. Uh, there's a policeman in the far left corner, you can see, um, uh, guarding the statue against graffitiing as well. So there's, a, there's, there's resistance to this symbolic refounding. Uh, and it's taking place at the highest levels. Here's Amer uh, Ted Cruz accusing uh, those taking down the Columbus statue of being the American Taliban. Now, it turns out this is a, a popular trope. Uh, three years ago, the uh, conservative newspaper called these graffitiists of these statues the Aussie Taliban. You can see there two black you know, robed figures there at the bottom uh, putting up you know, uh, uh, some kind of poster. And on, on the right, in another newspaper article, they called them cultural ga vandals. And uh, interesting, the, they used the indigenous flag there. And then they put superimposed uh, uh, this woman, a white woman, indigenously. So they mean uh, here they're, they're impugning that multiracial coalition I mentioned of uh, who they think are dangerous activists with a, with a Mao cap. And instead of a red star, they've got the indigenous star. So it's a very interesting combination of symbols, but deeply, you know, deeply critical of what's going on, somewhat paranoid, actually. Now, back to the Ted Cruz uh, Twitter exchange. It's really, really instructive. So we have Ilhan Omer responding. Hey, this was organized and led by indigenous people. Columbus literally started a genocide. Uh, he says, no, he didn't commit a genocide, literally or otherwise. Um, and then others weigh in, historians weigh in. Historian here, top left-hand corner, uh, Columbus enslaved many thousands of indigenous people and transported uh, thousands of them to Europe, etc., etc. And then many others weigh in here to say the same thing. Now, um, weighing in in his own way, uh, we have the president who's witnessed all this uh, over the summer saying, this is a result of left-wing indoctrination in our schools. And he says, no student should be made to feel ashamed of their history. Uh, and then a patriot responds, I'm okay with this education these days. Otherwise, has something to do with kids becoming obsessed with the dark spots of our history uh, that they begin to experience anger and hatred. And then someone retorts, well, so do you want to just teach the good kids the good parts of history so they think this, other, this country was flawless and perfect ever since it was created? Kids don't hate this country. They see how awful it is now and they want to fix it. Now, this has led um, to further debate. We have a, a prominent Native American activist, uh, Brett Chapman, uh, weighing in himself. The dirty secret, this is exactly what the national curriculum was designed to promote. He's referring to the 1776 commission and project. There's nothing new. That's the reason Native Americans have never been included in U.S. history. Uh, and I want to finish then with Carl Jacoby, who's a colleague and friend at, at Columbia University who teaches Native American history. I think he just gives the best example or uh, expression of quoting James Scott, who's a colleague at Yale, uh, of what historians do, which has nothing to do with critical race theory. He says, the purpose of history is not patriotism. 
It's understanding how the world that we inhabit came into being. History at its best is the most subversive discipline as it can tell us how things are likely to, that we take for granted came to be. Now, this is very different from the stated purpose of history that was expressed in the uh, White House sponsored uh, mini conference on the story of American history a few weeks ago, where, and I, which I listened to carefully, where uh, three historians said we need to, to uh, have history that will build up, uh, not tear down the souls of its readers. Let's rise up and build again. We need to have history that was both truthful and inspiring. Now, inspiring is not the kind of language modern historians use. As he says, the purpose is to understand how the world we inhabit came into being. And a good way to do that, in fact, the only way, is this multi-perspectival way that I mentioned before, where you look at each of these groups' experiences uh, and, uh, and, and everybody can read about them and, come and make up their own mind about what it all uh, adds up to today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Moses, you can't hear it, but there's a chorus of applause right now uh, okay. in the virtual world. And we do have some questions coming in. I want to uh, <coughs> apologize to anyone for any uh, technical glitches. Do keep in mind that we will be taking the entire presentation. And for those that are here, we'll have an uh, option to uh, access it again. And we will fix any of those glitches in the meantime. So we do apologize for any uh, audio that didn't come through. We caught all the images and whatnot. And we do have good questions. So let's start right out. I have a question for you, Professor Moses, from Todd Adams. Uh, the question is, thanks for maintaining how Bar uh, for mentioning how Bartol uh, Bartolome de las Casas was a mixed figure. And I have heard more prominently that he advocated importing Africans to replace Aboriginal peoples. Is that true? Uh, my understanding that is the case, yes. Uh, I'm not an expert on Latin America, but from my reading is that that is the case. Thank you for that. It is, uh, for, for every good thing, there might be a bad thing. On the other side, uh, uh, our good friend Lloyd Kramer has a question for you. Uh, uh, Lloyd asks, can we confront the history of injustice and still recognize any value or significance in the lives of people who committed injustices? Is a middle way possible so that the complexity of history goes beyond the recognition of past injustice and pivots towards more justice in the future? Right. Okay, and this allows me to, to make a point that I neglected to make during my talk, uh, especially the segment we talked about what to do with memorials today and monuments and so forth. Now, as you saw from Ted Cruz and the president's uh, criti criticisms and those of Boris Johnson, which I've, I, uh, I quickly skipped past, um, there's an accusation that uh, this practice is erasing history and that somehow like the Taliban or the Khmer Rouge and so forth. It's not quite right. No, no one's saying that just because this building won't be named after the philosopher Hume, that Hume will be erased from the philosophical canon, that we won't be reading his books anymore. Uh, that will continue as before. The issue is about public recognition, uh, not education, but adulation. Okay. So uh, likewise with Confederate monuments. I mean, obviously the, the Civil War will continue to be to be studied, um, and but but. Um, there'll be no heroic memories about that in public uh, to which uh, African-Americans um, have to be subject when they walk through the, the city square or through the campus of my university. Uh, now, uh, Professor Kramer's question for me is unclear about the, where he's pitching it in relation to this dichotomy between education and adulation. My view is that uh, monuments, if you're gonna have one, need to be symbols that bind uh, and that's got to do with founding moments, okay? And we're at, we are at a moment at the mo uh, currently in Australia here where uh, you know, a symbolic refoundation is taking place slowly. It'll have various spikes and troughs, uh, but it's been going on for some time. We're at a hot moment uh, right now, obviously. And uh, people are discussing, okay, we take down certain uh, figures which we don't... Uh, which, which cannot command consensus in the population, that are no longer figures of unity. Uh, so let's, let's, let's discuss among ourselves, as citizens, which figures we should put up, if any. Because you don't need to have monuments in the city square, do you? You can have, you can have a playground. It's up to historians uh, and the students in their classes to discuss these 
figures soberly, uh, in my view, less in relation to um, a balance sheet of good or bad, because we don't really do that in history. That's something for civics, right? Uh, we're interested in you know, the worlds they imagined and the effects they had in it and the way that um, created the world we live in today. It's not, it's not a normative uh, perspective. So that's how I'd answer that question. So someone like Thomas Jefferson, if there were memorials, Thomas Jefferson such an inspiration with the Declaration of Independence yeah. and it also lived a pretty uh, reprehensible life with his, uh, with his <laughs> yeah. slaves. So yeah. how, how, I guess the question to build on Lloyd Kramer's question, what is the middle way? Yeah, I don't know if there is a middle way, but we know, I mean, first of all, I'm reluctant to comment on, on American memory uh, about which I'm not as well informed as I am about Australia. Uh, but you saw from the various options uh, later in the talk, you know, about putting out plaques to and, uh, can, explanatory texts. It doesn't really satisfy people. Putting up cardboard buns doesn't really work. Encasing them doesn't really work. Uh, and what's clear from a few, purely functional perspective is that if they're not taken down, a, a, a substantial pro proportion of the population is unhappy about it and will either tear it down at some point or graffiti it. Then you've got a problem. Um, you know, there's symbolic instability, if you like. Uh, and that means the conversation is still going. Uh, the protest is, is, is palpable and uh, no amount of protecting it by a cordon of police or local vigilantes or putting a box on top of it uh, is really going to solve the problem. I mean, the problem is that it's no longer a a symbol that binds. Uh, it's up to the citizenry to, to thrash it out and it's going to take time. Now one reason it takes time is because it's very difficult for people to understand multi-perspectival thinking. I know that that may sound patronizing but it is very difficult. It's something that I took a long time to come to terms with myself. That is to fully imaginatively understand and appreciate how other people experience the world. And that's one thing that uh, a long training in history and even a BA uh, can impart. Uh, you know, so rather than ascribing to your opponents that they're wicked and evil or like the Khmer Rouge and the Taliban, you think, well, why is it that they feel so strongly about this? You know, what experiences uh, have they had or their parents that, you know, that may be traumatic memories that they've inherited that lead them to feel so strongly about this? Uh, maybe we should talk about those as well. And once you start pulling the thread in history like that, then you'll see the tapestry uh, uh, perhaps starts to unravel a bit. But, you know, history is violent and it's messy. And uh, uh, to not talk about that is the ideological, uh, is the ideological move. Okay, thank you for that response. Uh, we have from Todd Adams. Mm -hmm. uh, famously, an African-American artist, Kahinde Wiley, opposes... Uh, taking down Confederate statues, but surrounds them with many African figures. Isn't it partly a question of how it is done? The example you gave sounds and probably looks in, insincere. I'm not sure exactly which example that was. Maybe the cartoon. Uh, mm. that's, uh, that's a really fascinating case. I don't know it uh, example. And, uh, but this is where, where artists and, uh, who are making installations like this can play an extremely important role in disrupting uh, established memories and doing so in really creative ways. I mean, this is what their training uh, uh, prepares them to do. And, um, you know, I've seen a, 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 a subversive, um, you know, a, effect like this in another case. It, uh, in Germany, for example, Bismarck's memory is being debated because he was the one who founded the colonial empire in the 1880s. Uh, so he's seen as an imperialist and a bit, a bit like Churchill today in the UK and, and many people are wanting the many statues of Bismarck to come down, which is provocative for many German nationalists because he's one of the figures they can hold on to because uh, the Third Reich is, is obviously out of, um, out of bounds. Uh, and some people have said, well, you know, maybe we should do something you know, analogous to the case you mentioned there, Mr. Adams, which is, for example, put, put him upside down in the ground. So people come and say, well, why is Bismarck upside down? And it gets him thinking. And that's, that's what monuments can do. So rather than as objects of veneration, they become sites of reflection. Great. Thank you for that. 
Um, I'm going to go to a question from Nils Brubecker. Uh, regarding the purpose of history, uh, is it not reasonable to teach young children a version of history that will inculcate some kind of pride in our country and loyalty? Perhaps save the darker side of history for high school students and above. Well, I'm, I'm not a primary school teacher. I don't teach uh, five to ten year olds. And I've actually not given it much thought how you would handle that. Um, I, uh, thinking back to my own primary school education in the 1970s, I remember still thinking, still singing God Save the Queen before the Australian National Anthem was brought in, I think in 1975. And we we were taught the glorious, uh, the glorious explo uh, exploits of the explorers, and there was nothing about in, in indigenous history. There is now, uh, and, uh, but it's got nothing to do with critical race theory. It's just got, it's explaining to Australian children, well, you know, there were indigenous people here before. <laughs> and it's not about the history of massacres and atrocities. It's a history of how white settlement, European settlement uh, came. came. Um, and uh, of course you can't, you can't uh, saturate the curriculum with uh, atrocities and genocide for, for, for small children. That's out of the question. Uh, but you can, you can start to introduce them to this multi-perspectival approach. I'm not, I'm not in favor of, uh, of uh, uh, virtues like loyalty and, I forget the other one you mentioned, uh, patriotism for, for in history curriculums of any kind. I mean, this is, this is, uh, you know, what, what's, what uh, regimes do that America opposes, you know, Iran and so forth, um, where the curriculum, China, where the curriculum is very state centric and designed to produce compliant citizens. Here we want to produce free thinking. Here I mean the West generally. Free thinking, independent minded citizens who, uh, who, will, who are equipped to engage with uh, fellow citizens who have different perspectives and, and do so in a respectful and sober way and, and not resort to violence. Unfortunately, the, the potential for violence seems to be uh, brewing uh, in here as in many parts of the world, which means that this, the, the conversation isn't really working. Um, if you'll indulge me a question, uh, Professor <coughs> Notes, I, um, I'm, I'm curious about the notion of uh, commemorating individuals altogether and the notion that uh, somehow it isolates great deeds to individuals, but also isolates great guilt to individuals. And that uh, in the future, should we put up statues of individuals at all? And is there something about the way that um, we are beginning to see community as community action and uh, people together and not putting up statues that if you take it down, somehow cures the problem? In fact, this is, a, our, as you mentioned, settler colonialism is, has all sorts of embedded uh, things that have nothing to do with statues. The fact that we, you know, white people have more wealth than, than uh, those who are uh, the descendants of slaves or that we all walk on native land and don't even think about it. So can you speak a little bit to the, the idea of the great man of history and maybe if taking <coughs> down statues might be, um, uh, I guess, a cosmetic, the risk that it is a cosmetic change and not really I getting see. into that? Uh, I guess the question is about to what extent is symbolic refoundation of a of a settler colony uh, limited because it remains at the level of symbols. Thank you for making okay. my rambling a question. Yeah. I appreciate. Okay, uh, I mean, th to some extent, this is the debate about the way apartheid ended in the Truth and Justice uh, re a Reconciliation Commission that uh, saw the transition, of, you know, relatively peaceful transition. Uh, the critique is that. You know, there were these some confessions of guilt and apologies and recognition of, of uh, injustice, especially for violence uh, by the state. But uh, the land remained largely in the hands of um, the Boers and, and, and the Europeans and uh, didn't solve the structural injustice of um, the, the dispossession of Africans, which is, uh, of course, the cause of, of poverty and instability and so forth. Well, you know, that, that seems pretty obvious that that's the case. Uh, people who defend the, the, the TRC say, well, it, def it, it prevented a race war, uh, which was brewing. Um, so uh, I don't think you've got uh, one like that on the cards in many other settler colonies because of the different population ratios. So the South Africa was a case where the settlers were in the numerical minority, which is not the case here or in Australia, New Zealand and Canada. Uh, you know, we have to look at each case on its own, uh, own merits. But um, one way of answering this issue of, 
of symbolism and say, well, it's part of a package of uh, a uh, part of a of refounding um, because the conversation can then move to the issue of, of material injustice. Why is it that uh, many nations that were in home in this part of the world are now living thousands of miles west because of the Trail of Tears, obviously? Uh, and why did that happen? And uh, have, have there ever been proper reparations? I mean, this is where the reparations debate comes in, uh, which can take uh, many forms. It can be done by states or by institutions. Many American universities uh, like Brown and, and Yale, it's very, where they found, like, for example, like Glasgow University, have, which have found that they have profited from uh, slave, the slave trade early in the piece, uh, engaging in reparations in their own way. So, uh, and I understand there's a town in uh, Western North Carolina that's doing so as well. So it can take many forms. So this moves from the symbolic to the material. I don't think it's a zero-sum game. Thank you for that. You have definitely got Todd Adams thinking. He's got another uh, uh, observation okay. for you. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Todd mentions, of course, that he couldn't hear anything on the video. Okay. We apologize for that. That has nothing to do with Professor Moses. It's a, it's a tricky thing that we're figuring out. But we will, as, as Paul has been mentioning, we are going to get you a copy with all of the videos embedded and looking good. Um, but here's what Todd has to say. A question. I think you make a mistake when you include Native American history uncritically. There were always some settler supporters of the Cherokee and Creek. See John Adams and the New England missionaries, even Joseph Story. They were just overwhelmed. Then the Quakers supported Native Americans after the Civil War, but their cures were no better than the disease, which was racism. Uh, I know people can't be held to book, book blurbs, but the movement in America has been going on since the American Indian movement. Yes, I agree with that. I mean, that's why I say that the, the critique of the modalities of colonialism is, is part of the European political tradition. And the, the, the interactions between uh, uh, local nations and, and the settlers was different in every part of the country because you also had relationships between the French and so forth. It's an extremely complex history. But and I've got colleagues who work on this at the university uh, who, who offer courses specifically on, on this topic, whereas I tend to take a more global comparative view. But it, it, I'm, I'm always struck by the, by the broader pattern, though, you know, whatever the local complexity and so forth, that in the end, in the end, most of the land ends up in the hands of the settlers and, and at the expense of the, the local indigenous people and nation. Uh, and their population is decimated in various ways, whether by disease or massacre or displacement. Uh, and they've been structurally disadvantaged ever since. Uh, um, it's really only since the 1960s and 70s that we've had a, uh, a, um, uh, an indigenous nationalist movement, that um, rights movement that is free from many of the legal restrictions which they labored under before. It's the same in Australia as well, actually. Great, thank you for that. So one more time, please put your virtual hands together for Professor Dirk Moses. Can you hear it? Yeah, of course. Of uh, course, yes. Fine. So thank yeah. you so much and uh, uh, a fantastic talk and absolutely an important topic like all of our Humanities in Action topics, um, very much something we should uh, uh, be thinking about. We invite you to join us for our final uh, Humanities in Action talk, uh, which will be coming up in mid-October. And this is going to be on historical erasures. It's about uh, black newspapers in the United States and archiving. And uh, a big part of history is what gets saved and what doesn't. And so certainly uh, as we re, uh, re-examine the past, mm. we all should be thinking about what resources do we have. Uh, so that should be with Lenise Williams, an art historian, doing a wonderful talk. I want to thank Professor Dirk Moses one more time. I want to thank everyone involved at Carolina Public Humanities. I'm not going to go up and show my face again. I'll let Professor Moses wave goodbye to us Thanks. all. And we w- thank you. Join us again. Go to humanities.unc.edu and find out what we're up to. We hope to see you at a program soon.